<laughs> Keep an eye. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In the name of God, Bismillah, the most compassionate and the most merciful, we are presenting to you today um, another talk of our summer series by the Geological Society of Oman. The uh, presenter of today's talk is Dr. Thomas uh, Belgrano. He's a, geologic, a geologist and a postdoctoral researcher at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton, UK. He completed his undergraduate uh, studies at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, before actually working uh, at a gold exploration um, as, as a gold explorationist for a season in Northern Canada. He then later on moved uh, to New Zealand, uh, earning his master degree in structured geology at the University of Bern, and then went on to complete his PhD as well. His PhD work basically um, included uh, the producing of a map of the Samael Ophelite um, with Professor uh, Larry Diamond. <clears throat> including um, uh, the one at the center of this talk, inshallah, which he's going to basically uh, present. He spent the five uh, past winters working in Oman. Um, and as um, uh, basically uh, most of our visitors would be, um, uh, would be commenting that it's the most fun uh, field visits uh, for, of, in their entire life, as the exceptional geology of Oman is always attractive to many people who visit us. Um, his new project in South Amsterdam continues to investigate the ophiolite, studying the process <clears throat> by which gold and other valuable metals become enriched uh, in the ophiolite, and especially in the ophiolites uh, of Oman uh, ore deposits. Now, um, the, the Oman ophiolite is a very uh, dear uh, and a very uh, uh, important topic to many of us here in Oman. However, it is actually also important to many uh, scientists in the world. Those who actually study the Samael Ophiolite considers it as one of the largest and uh, exposed uh, Ophiolite suits in the, in, on Earth. And in fact, it's actually the most extensively studied uh, in the world. And what makes it actually more interesting and more uh, heart captivating to scientists to come and revisit and study and further understand and further study um, the Samael Ophiolites. The talk of um, uh, uh, Thomas today will basically will cover the origin, map distribution, and ore, ore deposits of the Samael Ophiolite volcanic sequence. So um, we will basically give the floor uh, to Dr. Thomas to start his uh, presentation. Thank you. Please do. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. And thanks to you also to uh, Abdul Munaim and uh, Talal and the Geological Society of Oman for having me on. So, yep, I'm going to talk about uh, part of my PhD work, which I completed at the University of Bern, as Dr. Ali said, uh, with Professor Larin Diamond in Switzerland. Uh, and in particular about this geological map that we published last year, uh, together with these co-authors here. Uh, they're all acknowledged uh, and in collaboration with the Institute for Rock Magnetism in the University of Minnesota, uh, National Earth Secrets, they're a, a consultancy in Muscat. And this was all, well, the vast majority of it was paid for by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Uh, so a big thanks are due to them. And they're also funding uh, my ongoing work uh, now at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton, uh, UK. So just before we get started, uh, a few acknowledgements. Uh, first and foremost, to our, our friends and colleagues at National Earth Secrets Consultancy in Muscat, uh, in particular, Khalid Al-Tobi and uh, Mohammed Al-Suleimani. Uh, they've been a fantastic help, uh, also great friends to us uh, and the University of Bern over our time working in Oman. Also, thanks to Haitam Al-Balushi at Moarid Mining, uh, and to, the, to PAM, the Public Authority for Mining in general, uh, but in particular, the Director General, Salim Omar Al-Ibrahim, uh, Mohammed Al-Batashi, Mohammed Al-Raimi, and Ali Al-Hashmi, who actually joined me in the field. 
And right before we get started, just a, a slightly sad note, uh, over the last uh, year, we lost uh, two real giants of Oman geology, professors Kenneth Clanny and Adolf Nicola. Uh, their tremendous contributions to Oman geology really laid the groundwork for all the work I'm going to talk about over the rest of the talk. Uh, so they will be sorely missed, and uh, thanks uh, to you, professors. <clears throat> so over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to review the Ophiolite's uh, volcanoscigraphy, its volcanic units, uh, together with the recent advances made concerning uh, the tectonic setting in which those uh, units and the Ophiolite formed. I'm then going to review the VMS deposits of the Ophiolite, then present uh, this volcanic map that we made of the Batina coast, and then discuss finally its implications for future copper and gold uh, deposit and perhaps even chrome deposit exploration. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the Somal Ophiolite situated on the northeastern tip of the Arabian Peninsula there. Uh, there's Muscat, many of you will be sitting there. Uh, hello. And you'll probably be familiar with its rough outline in white here. Uh, it sits as a tectonic nap, uh, like a slice of oceanic lithosphere uh, thrust onto the Arabian margin here. And it's exposed over some 17,000 square kilometers, which as uh, Dr. Ali pointed out, makes it by far the biggest ophiolite uh, abducted on Earth. Uh, and as you can see, there aren't any jungles covering this ophiolite. It's it's beautifully exposed rock over its entire length. Uh, so it's also the best exposed Ophiolite on Earth. So a real paradise for researchers and uh, even tourists, as we found out uh, a few weeks ago from Andrew Lawrence. If we look uh, at a simplified map of its geology here, taken from Nicolas' great 2000 paper, uh, we can uh, see that this, this, green, this green unit uh, that's the peridotite mantle rocks. Uh, the beige unit, that's uh, the gabbro lower crustal section. And the orange unit, that's the upper crust of uh, sheeted dikes and lavas. We can see that after it was thrust onto the Arabian margin here uh, at around 80 million years ago, uh, it was warped into a broad anticline with its axis running down the spine of the Hajar Mountains there relatively continuously. What that anticline has done is expose a, a beautiful cross-section, oblique cross-section through oceanic lithosphere along its trailing edge here, uh, dipping off to the east and uh, northeast. And that cross-section is really the focus of uh, my work in Oman. Here's a little uh, actual cross-section of that uh, adapted from Mike Searle's great uh, 2007 Geo Arabia paper. And you can see the Ophiolite uh, there, the Samile Nap, folded over the Jabal Akhtar dome. Uh, in this case, it pokes out. Uh, it's directly over the Jabal Akhtar window. And on its northeastern side, we expose this nice section uh, through the upper crust there. So zooming in on that upper crust, this is a schematic diagram we use uh, to sort of represent its architecture. And we have here the lower crustal gabbros uh, overlain by uh, the sheeted dike complex. And those dikes have fed the overlying geotimes lava unit. And uh, there are several other lava units uh, on top of that. To start off with, let's take a look at the portion of this crust that was produced at something like an axial spreading center. We call it the axial crust. And that uh, spreading center, it might have looked structurally something like uh, the spreading centers that run down the middle of many of our oceans. Uh, and it was active at around 96 million years ago. Uh, and what it produced was uh, the vast majority of the Ophiolite gabbros, uh, this sheeted dike complex, uh, as well as the related geotimes lava unit, and then this lasile lava unit formed uh, in some places very early on during the axial spreading, but mostly uh, just off axis, uh, so shortly after this, this spreading stage in the center here. Let's have a look at some field photos. 
of these axial uh, crustal units. Firstly, uh, the sheeted dike complex. Many of you would have visited uh, similar outcrops been around Muscat. Uh, we can see this outcrop is around five meters tall and you can see the sheeted dikes here running almost vertically across the page. That's fed the geotimes lava unit. Uh, they're comagmatic, which means that they derive from the same parental melt. Uh, and this outcrop is incredibly famous. Uh, you would have all seen pictures of it if you haven't uh, been there yourselves. And of course, uh, this outcrop gave that lava unit its slightly unusual name, geotimes. Uh, and that's because it featured on the uh, 1975 cover of Geotimes magazine. And here's a picture of Ali. Uh, doing its best impression of that famous cover shot. And finally, uh, with the axial and off-axial suite, we have the Lasile lavas. They are predominantly made up of much more primitive basalts than uh, the geotimes lavas. They're more magnesium rich, sorry, uh, which gives them, uh, which also means that they have less iron in general. And the result is after they've altered they take on this rather characteristic pale greenish gray color uh, compared to the reddish geotimes you'll remember. Uh, and if you look at their trace element geochemistry, we also find that they're consistently uh, depleted in incompatible elements like uh, titanium, uh, so much so that occasionally we even have bononites within this unit. Uh, and I'll talk about bononites a bit more later on. So <clears throat> before I move on uh, to the post-axial units. I just want to make an aside to talk about this old and controversial uh, topic of the tectonic setting in which this axial spreading actually took place. Uh, it's a topic that has followed the ophiolite uh, around since as long as geologists have been visiting it. Uh, and broadly speaking, the arguments can be split into two um, different models, one in which Axial spreading took place at a mid-ocean ridge, a true mid-ocean ridge, uh, something like uh, the East Pacific rise and the Eastern Pacific, uh, or axial spreading which took place in the upper plate of some form of subduction zone, uh, super subduction zone ridge. Now, a classic piece of evidence invoked in favor of the mid-ocean ridge model is that uh, those axial lavas and intrusions, the geotimes unit, have a geochemistry uh, similar to that of more mid-ocean ridge basalts. What I'm going to argue is that in recent years, this idea has been overturned. And in fact, the uh, detailed chemistry of these uh, rock units rather argues in favor of the super subduction zone ridge model. So the most obvious expression of that uh, can be found just by walking around in the field. Uh, and that's that the axial lava suites in Oman are not uh, all basaltic, uh, whereas at mid-ocean ridges, the vast, vast majority of lavas produced are basaltic. That's where the B in Morb comes from. Uh, whereas in Oman, basaltic andesites are very common in the geotimes units, and andesites are even relatively common. Uh, and just to illustrate that, uh, here's a picture of my car parked in front of a huge geotimes andesite flow in the Yankul area. And if you go to the Yankul area uh, and whack around at the rocks, you'll see that these uh, geotimes andesite flows are incredibly common. Uh, they go off basically as far as the eye can see. Uh, so this was pointed out fairly uh, early on by Metcalf and Chavez in 2008 using some statistics and then again noted by McLeod and co-authors 2013 and ourselves last year. The second uh, piece of evidence I'm going to talk about turned into something of a tipping point, I think, for this argument. Uh, and it came from uh, McLeod and co-authors 2013 geology paper in which they deduced that those axial lavas and related dikes uh, fractionated in the presence of around half a weight percent of water uh, they call that moist morb. Now, uh, that's extremely unusual for true mid-ocean ridge settings, uh, but is uh, directly predicted and entirely usual for super subduction zone ridge settings. Finally, uh, <clears throat> throughout the axial lavas, 
uh, and especially in those early expressions of the Lasalle unit uh, formed on axis even, we find negative niobium tantalum uh, concentration anomalies relative to MORB. Uh, now, these negative niobium tantalum anomalies have been noted for a long time, and the most accepted way to produce those is by mixing a component of fluid or melt that's derived from somewhere in which rutile was, was stable uh, into, our, into our magmas up here. And uh, that rutile in the source uh, sequesters, keeps a hold of those niobium and tantalum, but lets go elements like thorium and the light rare earths, resulting in a, in a negative niobium and tantalum anomaly in the resulting uh, mixture. So those are everywhere. And uh, they are very common in all kinds of super subduction zone settings, but relatively uncommon in mid ocean ridge settings. The final sort of independent and uh, rather conclusive line of evidence, I think, has come about in the last few years, starting with Ryu and co authors uh, showing that peak metamorphism uh, occurred synchronously with axial spreading. Uh, Peak metamorphism in the metamorphic soul beneath uh, the ophiolite, that is, occurred at around 96 million years, uh, the same time as the axial spreading. Uh, this doesn't seem to be possible in a mid ocean ridge setting. Uh, here, if we inverted that ridge and turned it into a subduction zone to abduct the ophiolite, uh, that metamorphism must post date the spreading. But in this case, it's synchronous, which is directly predicted by the super subduction zone model. This was confirmed quite spectacularly, actually, by uh, recent dating by Guimet and co-authors of the prograde burial phase of the metamorphic soul's formation. And they dated that prograde metamorphism in garnets at uh, 103 to 104 million years ago. So that's 8 million years older than the axial spreading phase. Now, there's no real way uh, to achieve that with the mid-ocean ridge model, but again, it's uh, pretty much predicted by the super subduction zone ridge model. So just in summary, science is never finished. But uh, in this case, I would say that steadfast proponents of the mid-ocean ridge model do have their work cut out, uh, finding viable explanations uh, for each of these independent lines of evidence. Uh, and from my perspective, at least, I think we should focus on trying to figure out why the super subduction zone ridge was more like in the first place and uh, what this subduction zone might have actually looked like. So tectonic rant over, uh, we'll look at the post-axial phase. So that's overprinted uh, the axial crust, the dikes and geotimes. And in terms of volcanics, that's manifested as uh, the alley group, uh, which we've split by uh, geochemistry into a tholeide series Tholeitic alley group, Tholeitic alley unit, and uh, Bonanite series, Bonanitic alley unit. Let's have a look at some of those rocks. Here's a fairly typical picture of Tholeitic alley lavas. Uh, you can see they're kind of reddish, just like Geotimes was. Uh, but in this case, I'm, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it on your screens, uh, but you can definitely check it out in the in the paper. Uh, this pillow is riddled with small white uh, filled vesicles here. They show up as white because uh, they're filled with bright white zeolite minerals. And uh, all those vesicles are not particularly common in the Geotimes unit, but they are common here. And we relate those probably to uh, the fact that these lavas were relatively rich in water. Uh, we've measured that now directly as around 2 weight percent water. Uh, you'll also see, <coughs> well, you may or may not be able to see, but I can describe it, that it looks like it's been raining on this outcrop. See these little black dots there? Uh, well, if you keep hammering at the rock, you'll find more of those raindrops. In fact, they're not raindrops. Uh, they're gray spots all through the lava cross section. And those are very common within both of the alley uh, group units. Uh, but they're I haven't seen them, at least, in the, in the geotimes or LaSalle units. And they are probably also related to this fluid exolution story. Uh, but that's kind of another story for another day. 
Uh, so keep an eye out for those black spots uh, if you're trying to figure out what, what unit you're in. Onto the Bonanites. Uh, we were the first ones to produce maps and uh, detailed field descriptions of these Bononitic lavas. And here's a fairly typical outcrop of Bononites altered to a sort of moderate uh, grade of pre night Pompeiite fasces. And that beigeish green color uh, comes from that uh, Pompeiite in the rock. Uh, there's also lots of zeolites in there. You see these white, white uh, knots between the pillows. And you can also see pretty clearly uh, that these lavas very efficiently fill the spaces uh, between them, these pillow lavas. And that's suggesting that they were very runny, uh, probably very hot as well, uh, which fits with the general bonanitic composition, which is hot and magnesium rich. Uh, for those who don't know who bo what bonanites are, uh, which is probably is a few of you, uh, <clears throat> they are, globally speaking, a relatively rare volcanic rock. Uh, but when we're talking about ophiolites and certain super subduction zone settings, they're actually rather common. And they're defined as rocks with uh, more than 52 weight percent silica and eight weight percent magnesium oxide, uh, which is an unusually high amount of magnesium at a given silica content, essentially. And also uh, less than half a weight percent of titanium. So they're in general deplete depleted and incompatible elements. Now, this uh, slightly peculiar composition, uh, the best way we know to form it is by fluid flux, so water flux melting of a mantle source, which has already produced a melt. Uh, and in this case, that would probably be geotimes or foliated galley before it. Now, the Bonanuti galley unit comes in a lot of different flavors makes it quite tricky to uh, map in the field. In this case, those bononites have been uh, altered at Greenschitz fasces, so a little bit higher temperature. And here they take on that appearance uh, similar to the Lasile unit uh, due to an abundance of chlorite and albite in the secondary um, mineral assemblage. Uh, in this case, a suggestion that it's a bononite and not Lasile would be these large vesicles here in the core of the pillar. Those are filled with radial epidote uh, growth is very easy to spot. And yeah, those are quite common in Greenschitz fasces bononites. On the other hand, uh, bononiticale is typically at the top of the, the lava stack, which means that sometimes it's very weakly altered, or at least low grade altered, uh, into something uh, known as brownstone fasces. That's clay, basically clay dominated uh, alteration. And in this case, uh, it can be possible to find beautiful olivine phenocris all around the rims of these uh, of these lavas. And that's actually how we found this outcrop, uh, me and Ali there. We were walking up a wadi and saw a tow of olivine sand coming out of a, a small gully. And we followed it up and found this really beautiful exposure of uh, relatively low-grade you know, bononite pillows. So that caps off the regional volcanic history of the Ophiolite. On top of that, uh, we have the Salahi lava unit, or V3, and that's thought to have formed sometime around the collision and reduction phase, uh, but it's not regionally distributed. It's only really well developed in the Salahi block, uh, although it is uh, very thick in the Salahi block. Uh, so there's definitely uh, something to be said for looking more into those lavas, but I won't go into them more here. And then <clears throat> the entire sequence is capped by the Suhaila Formation sediments, uh, named after the Suhaila village uh, down Wadi Jizi. And because I know there are a lot of basin uh, enthusiasts on the, on the stream, I included this great picture of the top of the Ophiolite sequence. I call it the death and resurrection of the Ophiolite. There you have the uh, Tholiatic Ali lava unit here at the top of the section. Uh, there's Ali again, uh, overlain by metalliferous sediments, umbers, which transition up into radiolarian cherts, pelagic cherts, uh, which again transition into limestones, uh, recording the uplift of the ophiolite through the carbonate compensation depth. Now, <clears throat> while I talk about these uh, lava units as uh, discrete mappable uh, entities, 
in fact, uh, field relations and geochemistry show that these units are very much transitional with one another. Uh, we have uh, interbedding uh, and transitional compositions between all of the units. And this is pretty well demonstrated by these chromium, uh, yttrium versus vanadium, titanium, whole rock, lava geochemistry plots. Uh, it's the only plots I have in the talk, so bear with me. Basically, we're starting with the geotimes unit in green, follows the same color coding as this, as this diagram. And then we go to more and more depleted, uh, yttrium depleted in this case, compositions uh, through time. Uh, to LaSalle, Sole de Galli, and then finally the most depleted Boninites there. And the same in terms of vanadium titanium ratios here. We start in geotimes, make our way into LaSalle, Sole de Galli, and finally the highest ratios uh, in Boninite de Galli. Now, there are some arrows just to illustrate that. What you can see is that there are obvious fields here, but they're not separated. Uh, they're continuous with one another. And <clears throat> this unbroken progression from morb-like magnetism to bononitic magnetism is characteristic of volcanic sequences produced uh, in early or nascent arc settings uh, that we call proto-arcs. Uh, this has been pointed out and known for quite a while. Uh, that depletion with time rule is called the subduction initiation rule. Uh, Waterman Stern wrote about it in their great 2011 paper. And essentially, uh, we came to know about this, this rule and understand it from looking at the Izubon and Mariana uh, proto-arc record uh, preserved in the four-arc wall of the Izubon and Mariana trench in the Western Pacific. Uh, <clears throat> so the Oman series is, broadly speaking, comparable uh, to that IBM record, uh, but there are some fundamental differences. Uh, and we discussed that in some detail in this Solid Earth paper in 2019. Uh, but I can sum it up basically by saying that the initial mantle in Oman was relatively fertile, uh, so it could produce more black lavas to start off with. And in Oman's case, subduction was tectonically induced by far field compression and then arrested within around 10 million years. Uh, whereas for the IBM, uh, the initial mantle appeared to have already produced some, some melts and subduction was uh, spontaneous due to gravitational collapse of an instable uh, plate boundary. And then subduction just kept on going uh, into a fully fledged arc system, uh, which of course is still there today. So just to briefly summarize this tectonic evolution, uh, and at this point I will just state that although I think that axial spreading argument, uh, the axial spreading debate is probably approaching something like uh, agreement in terms of super subduction zone. Uh, everything after that is very much very much uh, under under study, uh, including this this part of the talk. Uh, it's open to interpretation, and I'm sure our ideas are going to develop over the next few years. But this is what uh, this is at least is the model that I consider seems to fit the puzzle piece that fits the most uh, pieces around it right now. And we can add uh, from that Guimet paper, uh, this 104 million year age for initial lower plate burial, initial lower plate burial uh, and subduction initiation uh, must have been shortly before that. But of course, uh, you'll notice that these are fairly simple 2D cartoons. Uh, Nature occurs in three dimensions, of course, in four dimensions, actually. So moving on from here, uh, the map view equivalent of this, uh, of this progression is very important. And uh, the best work done on that so uh, recently has been from our paleomagnetic colleagues, in particular, Morris and co-authors in 2016, and more recently, Van Hinsbergen, 2019. They showed, looking at uh, paleomagnetic directions in the gabbros and dikes that the axial spreading ridge uh, that's now preserved as the sheet of dike complex and gabbros in Oman uh, initially started out with a northeast uh, southwest strike uh, so orthogonal to what it is today and that during the formation of the ophiolite probably during this post-axial magnetism the slab here was rolling back uh, and rotating until the entire ophiolite 
was parked on the continent here. So <clears throat> if I were to redraw this diagram, uh, perhaps I should have continents sitting on both sides here. So it's pretty it's potentially pretty complicated. Uh, but again, I stress that this these ideas uh, are definitely subject to change, but it's an exciting area of research. So uh, on to the motivation uh, for updating those volcanic maps and probably the motivation for many of you to join the talk. That's the uh, copper gold volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits or VMS deposits. Uh, briefly, how these things, how we think they form. Uh, we believe that cold seawater infiltrates down through oceanic crust uh, that's been recently formed. It's still hot. Uh, it leaches metals as it goes before returning to the seafloor, hot and buoyant, to vent at these black smoker type sites. There's a picture there of one. You know, we know, we can sit, find these things on the modern seafloor. That's how we know so much about this particular deposit type. And where they vent, uh, the fluids cool down and they uh, precipitate large accumulations of metal sulfide minerals. And if uh, those metal sulfide minerals accumulate sufficiently, and then the entire block of oceanic crust uh, makes its way onto land to somewhere we can access it, uh, we call these accumulations the MS deposits. And there's a picture of some very high grade uh, copper ore from Oman. So, so far in Oman, uh, 19 deposits have been discovered. Uh, some of them are mined, some of them are unmined. And you can see them as these little blue dots here, spaced sort of roughly evenly along the upper crustal section. Uh, several of these deposits are at the permitting or early development stage. Uh, Washihi uh, down here, uh, Mahab and Mikhail South. Uh, and active exploration uh, is ongoing to some extent in most of the blocks. Uh, but I would just say that uh, those, those uh, deposits in the permitting and development stage probably need to be pushed forward into production for this uh, exploration phase to really get kick-started again. So just having a look at this copper grade versus uh, deposit tonnage plot here, I've plotted up to start with uh, all the VMS deposits in the USGS Global Database and all the porphyry copper deposits uh, in the same database. Uh, because porphyry copper is uh, another, or is the, the main deposit type from which we get our copper from. So it's an interesting comparison. Uh, what you can see is that on average, the copper grade tends to be higher in the VMS deposits, uh, but the tonnages are quite a lot lower. Uh, these are all log scales. Uh, so these are absolutely monstrous deposits, uh, although some big some big VMS deposits do exist. So, and uh, sorry, these uh, lines here, these tie lines, uh, they'll become clearer in a second, uh, represent the contained, total contained copper metal uh, tonnage in, in any of these deposits. So let's have a look at uh, Ophiolite hosted VMS deposits, firstly in Trudos, they have uh, in, in purple squares and then in Oman in the red triangles. Uh, we can see these are all VMS deposits and they, they scatter sort of among the VMS field from USGS. And they're relatively similar uh, between Oman and Trudos. Uh, Trudos has uh, at least one much bigger deposit uh, that hasn't been discovered at least so far in Oman. And I guess from this, it's, it's clear that in comparison to porphyry copper deposits, these VMS deposits are never going to represent uh, globally uh, very important sources of copper. But if we do look at these uh, larger deposits in Oman, we find that they contain something between 100, 150,000 tons of copper. And of course, that is an important resource for Oman itself, uh, strategically and economically. Uh, and Copper prices are doing very well at the moment. So gold prices, incidentally, uh, China's bouncing back and building things, uh, basically. And so at these high prices, uh, they're actually quite a bit higher than that right now. Uh, one of these big deposits, the total contained metal, if you're recovering all of it, uh, approaches a value of around a billion US dollars. So 
they're worth something. Uh, obviously, developing a mine uh, costs a lot of money. Finding a mine costs a lot of money. But if Oman is providing a lot of those services uh, domestically, uh, then a lot of that money is going to stay in your economy. So in terms of the motivation for actually updating those maps, uh, that comes from uh, Sam Gilgan. He was a previous PhD student at the University of Bern. His work published in the 2014 Economic Geology uh, Journal, where he found that the VMS deposits hosted by this Bonneritic Alley unit here, uh, this is basically the same diagram as the one I showed before, just a slightly earlier version with different thicknesses. He found that the VMS deposits hosted by that Bonneritic Alley unit tend to have higher gold grades than all the other uh, units hosted, all the other deposits hosted by other units. Uh, those numbers are gold grades. Uh, they're not spectacular gold grades. They wouldn't be classed as gold-rich deposits uh, by the typical definitions, uh, but those are definitely economic and recoverable gold grades. Uh, and as well as that, he figured out that deposits with their foot wall in the geotimes unit, uh, so those built basically on top of the axial crust uh, before the post-axial phase, uh, tend to have higher copper grades and also to be quite big in terms of tonnage. So uh, the reason for making the maps, uh, firstly, uh, maps are generally important as a contextual aid for understanding regional geology, uh, VMS systems, and just going about exploration. But secondly, uh, this new volcanic map, if it splits up these four units, should allow companies interested uh, in the different metals uh, to target uh, areas, regions for exploration. So <clears throat> there's the mapping uh, area outline in red dash there. Uh, we couldn't cover the whole ophiolite, unfortunately. It's just too much driving. Uh, but uh, we did cover the vast majority of the upper crustal outcrop and the existing uh, VMS deposits there in blue. But I would just say at this point uh, that it would be worthwhile uh, repeating this mapping exercise in smaller areas, uh, perhaps down here, of volcanics. And if anyone's interested in doing that, uh, especially any, any Omani uh, students or researchers, then uh, get in contact uh, and I can give you some tips. So to start off with, uh, we have the excellent maps uh, produced by uh, Bishy Metal Exploration and uh, Beige RM and uh, distributed by PAM. And those essentially differentiate two volcanic units V1 and geotimes, and then V2, uh, which was encompasses all of those uh, off and post axial units here, uh, but doesn't discriminate them. In the literature, uh, we've known about these four units for a while now, and by the end of the project, uh, we didn't add any more units to this stratigraphy, but we did update the stratigraphic relationships between them and uh, the thicknesses by quite a lot. To produce the map, uh, of course, we started with those excellent uh, geological maps distributed by PAM. Uh, seven of those covered the study area. But we also uh, digitized and georeferenced and uh, figured out what was mapped in a bunch of smaller maps uh, accompanying company reports and uh, scientific studies, things like that. And those are also immensely helpful. On top of that, of course, we did our own mapping. Uh, many thousands of field observations are represented there by blue dots along the length of the ophiolite. But what we found was that you can't always tell uh, what volcanic unit you're looking at when you're standing in front of it at the outcrop. Uh, they don't always look like those type locality photos I showed earlier. And in that case, uh, we relied on the geochemistry of samples uh, to tell us which lava unit we were looking at. So we firstly went through the literature and found uh, 89 analyses that were geolocated and could be assigned, uh, each one there sort of color-coded to one of the different units. And we collected our own samples. Uh, there, they just should have just shown up, uh, each color-coded to a unit, 190 of those analyzed their geochemistry in Switzerland. And essentially those uh, sample suites provided us with 
very reliable reference points from which to base our interpretations and mapping uh, in, between, in between points. So we have our maps, our, our base maps, our field observations, and our samples. The final and uh, really key ingredient in the mapping project was the aeromagnetic survey uh, kindly provided by PAM, which we interpreted together with uh, a baseline rock magnetic study uh, that we performed on the different units, uh, finding they had systematically different magnetic properties. What that allowed us to do, uh, as well as uh, tracing the continuation of structures and units between field observations, uh, was to map the presence of those units underneath a uh, thin sedimentary cover. So underneath the wadi gravels, uh, between wadis, and also out to some extent underneath the Batana plain, uh, greatly expanding the coverage of the original maps uh, from outcrop only to a real uh, bedrock map. To give a little example of how that mapping workflow worked, here's an example, a digitized example of the existing maps uh, in the area of the Mandus deposit. Uh, there's a bit of echo there in the line. I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Ali, if your vo volume turns down a bit, maybe. Uh, but here we can see it's, it's a northeast dipping section through the upper crust. So the sheeted dikes here, SD, some intrusions, and then a thin layer of V1, SE1 geotimes lavas overlain by a thick but undifferentiated uh, SE2 or, or V2 package. If we look on the magnetism, a V2 package can be uh, split down the middle uh, into a weakly magnetic region and a, a highly magnetic region. Uh, you can see the Mandus deposit there shows up as a magnetic low. And <clears throat> together with sampling and field observations, that produces a revised map uh, splitting that V2 section uh, down the middle uh, and even adding a third unit on top uh, and we've also been able to add uh, inferences of structure undercover. And in general, you can just see that this bedrock map uh, covers a lot more area than the uh, initial outcrop only map. So there's the final volcanic map. Uh, covers 1,200 square kilometers of outcrop, uh, but 2,100 square kilometers of bedrock. And to get an idea of the scale and its detail, that previous example I just showed you uh, covers that small black box there. And it just continues down uh, all the way through. Now this map is available <coughs> to any of you together with a, a detailed manuscript explaining uh, how we produced it, uh, published in the Solid Earth Open Access Journal. Uh, that's available online if you Google uh, this title, you'll find it. Uh, and if you go to that website and navigate to the supplement, you can download a multi-layer geospatial PDF version of the map uh, in which uh, each of the data sets we use to produce it, those samples and field observations are, are toggleable in, in software like Illustrator or Adobe Acrobat. Uh, so I encourage you to go and check it out and uh, I guess the key point of this, this distribution method is that you can use that map and modify it uh, as much as you like. And that's definitely our intention. So <clears throat> in terms of exploration for ore deposits, uh, the map itself should provide a great sort of just context for geologists. And I encourage uh, exploration geologists just to check it out and see, see what comes to mind. But we can already make some uh, preliminary first order deductions. So firstly, in terms of looking for those copper rich, uh, large VMS deposits at the top of the geotimes unit, well, uh, for that, you would want the top of the geotimes unit to be exposed in the bedrock somewhere. And that is the case for most of the length of the ophiolite. It's uh, sort of uh, boxed off in green, but it's not the case for around 40 kilometers long strike in the Highline block down here. So this isn't a great place uh, to look for those big copper deposits simply because uh, that top geotimes horizon has been faulted out, tectonically removed. Uh, that's not to say that other kinds of deposits aren't, aren't there. 
in terms of those gold bearing deposits we talked about remember they uh, situated in the Bonnerite Bonnerite alley unit uh, we found that those Bonner, the Bonnerite alley is very heterogeneously distributed along the length of the ophiolite sometimes it's two kilometers thick and sometimes it's not present at all uh, so that uh, has some significant implications for exploring for these gold bearing deposits uh, in the Fitz block up here uh, sort of between Liwa and Shinas we find the thickest accumulations of bonanites, uh, two kilometers thick. And additionally, the section is repeated. Uh, so there's really a lot of prospective terrain uh, up here. Uh, but we also have sections of bonanites uh, in most of the blocks and some very thick accumulations down here in the Highline block and also here on the southwest side of the Ophiolite. Now, <clears throat> in terms of more uh, local targeting, of, of VMS deposits. Uh, our group uh, at the University of Bern has been working on the implications of different alteration types, uh, like epidocytes, uh, but they, they don't seem to represent a particularly reliable exploration vector towards VMS deposits. Uh, instead, uh, looking at our map, we've come up with some general rock associations that seem to point uh, in the right direction for VMS deposits. And that general rock association essentially is a combination of syn volcanic normal faults, uh, related volcanoclastic breaches. They're often very blocky and they sit on the scarps of these faults. Late swarms of uh, boninite and uh, foliatic alley dikes and boninite lava infills uh, within depressions formed by these faults, uh, where you can map, uh, recognize this association of rocks. Uh, you typically have long-lived uh, major extensional corridors and if you're following uh, those corridors out undercover it's probably a good place to look uh, for mineralization and our map identifies a few of these uh, the most the, the, the bit the largest of which uh, has been known for a long time actually the so-called bowling alley uh, graben or half graben running down south here marked by this line you have geotimes repeated in the east uh, which suggests uh, a graben axis through here. Lots of disseminated sulfide mineralization and small sulfide showing scossons. Uh, off this little splay here, we have the major Bida and Aja deposits sitting in one of these bononite infills. Uh, there's blue, a blue unit there are these uh, volcanoclastic breaches, and uh, they're very common along here. And then what we uh, think is that that bowling alley continues down south past the LaSalle deposit. Again, you have infill bononites here and a repetition of geotimes to the east, suggesting something like a graben through here. Uh, it just in this case, it's been dismembered and uh, jiggled about a bit by uh, abduction-related northwest, southeast faulting here and here along Wadi Jizi. A similar association shows up on the southwest side of the Ophiolite near the Raqqa VMS deposit. It's got a relatively decent tonnage and uh, some good gold grades. Uh, and in this case, we have a, a very spectacular swarm of alley dikes. Uh, we tested their geochemistry and they're, they're definitely related to the, to the alley uh, stage. And they're cutting up and almost pointing directly at the deposit itself, uh, which sits in this infill of bonaritic alley lavas uh, together with some blocky breaches there in, in blue uh, again just suggesting that we had a long-lived extensional structure uh, a great place to build up a vms deposit and perhaps the most spectacular thing uh, we found in our mapping project was this uh, east dipping lithospheric section in the wadi rajmi uh, and safwa deposit area uh, these figures are all from uh, the paper, so if you want some more explanation, uh, that's probably the best place to go. But essentially what we have is a east dipping uh, cross section through the oceanic lithosphere, the oceanic crust, uh, starting with Hartsburgite and uh, peridotite on the left here in the west, and then uh, moving up through the lower crust uh, in grays and browns, and then into the uh, upper crust in colors, greens and reds. A uh, thick accumulation of bonanites in purple capped by this light blue sediments there. So, so highly formation. 
Uh, <clears throat> and here we see the Safwa deposit. That's a, a quite small VMS deposit, but with good gold grades. Uh, and that's sitting between these two major Bonanite dike swarms that just rip up all the way through the lower crust and uh, feed these thick accumulations of Bonanites. Uh, they're on either side. And that dark purple unit there is fully sheeted uh, late dikes. And uh, the offsets of the crustal, the axial crustal unit here suggests that this entire block is somewhat downfolded. Uh, so this could be viewed as a, as a grab in itself, just tipped on its side uh, with the Safo deposit sitting bang in the middle. The other cool thing that came out of this section, uh, we noticed that these dike swarms, they root into, into faults, syn uh, volcanic faults, uh, that in turn root into shear zones uh, that extend down into the mantle. They're dinitic shear zones uh, full of myelinites. And uh, looking at the aerial photos for these shear zones, trying to trace them, I noticed all these little uh, excavations around, uh, not so little in fact, uh, and figured out that those are actually uh, economic chromatite deposits, uh, chrome deposits uh, that we weren't really studying, uh, but that sort of just showed up on the radar. And uh, other people have studied those chrome deposits uh, in great detail, in fact. And what they found, uh, Hugh Rollinson and co-authors, uh, was that those chrome deposits formed from melts uh, with an alley-like composition, uh, starting from foliatic alley-like composition and developing into bononitic composition. They had high chromium, uh, relatively oxidized, and low titanium. That's a perfect description of a bononite. So, <clears throat> What this is telling us is that at the same time as we had a gold-bearing VMS defo deposit forming at the seafloor, the Cretaceous seafloor, uh, we were forming chromite deposits five kilometers down in the top of the mantle section. Uh, so this is a nice, a nice connection, the bonanite chromatite uh, connection. It makes sense structurally. It makes sense in terms of geochemistry and petrogenesis. Uh, and what it means is that these thick accumulations of bonanites and their related dike swarms uh, potentially represent a promising avenue for exploring for these upper mantle chromite deposits. Uh, I'm going to leave it at there. It's definitely a big, uh, perhaps, uh, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of that interest, uh, there's this great paper by Kanke and Takazawa, uh, 2014, where they show uh, looking at the same area, that these shear zones actually extend all the way down to the metamorphic sole. Uh, so they're lithospheric scale shear zones that pretty much come up to the to the seafloor here. What that means, uh, these, these are dinitic shear zones, so they've recorded the passage of melts through them, is that this Rajmi section represents a complete cross-section through a subduction system uh, from the paleo subduction interface at the metamorphic sole uh, up to the seafloor. Uh, and we're forming ore deposits uh, at numerous, at several stages uh, throughout it. I don't think any uh, other section like this exists in the world, or even in the Ophiolite. Uh, it's completely unparalleled, and from my perspective, it's completely uh, spectacular. So uh, this is not just a metal resource, but it's also a great scientific resource and a great, I think, geotourism resource. Uh, thinking again back to Andrew Lawrence's talk. So that's my final slide with content on it. Uh, here's a final picture. It was on the flyer. It's one of my favorites from Oman. It's of a, a stack of geotimes pillow lavas overlain by a, a metalliferous sediment and umber there, perhaps related to a nearby VMS deposit. And the whole thing is cut by a squiggly dike. And I think it really well sums up uh, the natural and scientific beauty of the Ophiolite. Uh, it was taken this year after the rains in January, uh, this beautiful pool. So just quickly to go through my conclusions, I think that the Ophiolite formed entirely above some kind of young or nascent subduction zone. Uh, our geological map is available and open access. Please use it, uh, download it, uh, print it, have your lunch on it. Uh, modify it, that's what it's for. Uh, for those copper deposits, top geotime seems to be faulted out through much of that southern, southeastern highline block. 
uh, bonerite lavas are discontinuous along the ophiolite, uh, but in some places they're pretty thick, and these represent promising areas to target gold-bearing VMS deposits. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, exploration targeting, uh, extensional corridors with blocky breaches, late dike swarms, bonerite infills, uh, they are highly prospective, they're commonly mineralized, and I think tracing them out undercover uh, is a good option for future exploration. And then really finally, this time, uh, quick note on the non-metallic resources of Oman. Uh, that Rajmi section is incredible, uh, and it's globally unparalleled. Uh, geotourism, of course, is a renewable resource, unlike copper, and potentially is even bigger business than copper. So it's worth preserving. And of course, people and water uh, will always be the most valuable resources on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, there's little point in developing these complex geological approaches if we're not concurrently developing local expertise on topics such as gaining social license, uh, environmentally sustainable mine management and remediation. And uh, that should really be uh, coming from Omanis. So that's the end of my talk. I hope I didn't run uh, too much over time. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, just quickly, there's a list of the references. And if you have any trouble accessing these papers, uh, shoot me an email to this address, and I'll give you a link to a zip package with them all in. Uh, thanks. Dr. Ali, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Just enjoying your uh, talk and uh, Basically, I take notes as well. Um, uh, I thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Geological Society of Oman for um, actually uh, bringing us up to date in terms of uh, the latest work that has been done uh, towards the Oman Ophiolites, and specifically in this case um, uh, for VMS, and uh, in this case, how. Um, uh, liking your actually approach is that these are the areas that you can actually go and look for uh, copper. These are the areas that you can go and look for uh, gold uh, uh, in the Oman Ophiolite. I think this kind of work um, is, uh, it proves to be um, for the many years uh, that have passed actually would be a very good resource that um, our scientists as well as our uh, companies that are working in uh, the exploration of, um, of uh, minerals, precious minerals as well, will be interested actually in, in pursuing in learning from and will be interested to actually take notes from and be able to implement and apply in their own uh, in their own way um, we'll open now the um, floor for questions so if you have uh, any questions uh, you would like to ask our esteemed uh, dr thomas um, today um, by all means uh, do, uh, do do send me the the questions if you don't mind Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ali. If, 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 any, if anyone does have uh, questions that come to them later, then they're willing to, to use that email that I put up on the reference slide. Uh, and I think the entire talk will stay on YouTube. So you should be able to find that. And I, I'm very happy to discuss this. I can talk about this all day. If you don't mind, actually, I will, um, uh, I'm a little bit eager to start the questions. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it, it seems basically now that um, the, in, in this case, the nomenclature of the, um, uh, the volcanic sequence, um, the least to say in this case, is following the idea that it is more of a, um, more than two events in this case, more than two volcanic events that have led to the accumulation of uh, the La Salle and the Ali uh, Theolites and the Ali Bonanites uh, uh, units. So that is basically the current, the current consensus. Is, 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 that, is that what uh, I understood uh, uh, accurate? Uh, consensus is definitely a, a difficult thing to arrive at when it comes to the Omano, if you like, and that there are groups using alternative nomenclatures. We, we, summarized the, we tried to summarize the nomenclature equivalences in that Solid Earth paper, but... Uh, this point that we can also exp we don't necessarily have to explain this progression in terms of uh, two units, but rather as a continuous change manifested in steps as different units. 
I think that comes back to the way we name them. Uh, okay. we, yeah. So two, you can still split the progression into, uh, broadly speaking, an axial stage and a, a post-axial stage, uh, which is how it's traditionally been done, and it's still valid. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but thinking, at least thinking of knowing that that is can also be thought about as a progression, as a continuum, is a good idea. And that also applies spatially as well. Uh, people have traditionally differentiated the, the northern and southern blocks, uh, but there's not that much evidence to suggest that anything other than a, a continuous progression exists between them. Okay, um, so more of I mean the, the very interesting aspect of your presentation was that you provided uh, more uh, evidence, not only from your own research, but from others in this case, that sort of um, back the idea that it was more of a, a supra subduction zone uh, rather than uh, a morb and then uh, a two, a two phase morb and then a supra subduction zone. So let's go to one of the uh, questions that I have here. Though a bit uh, <laughs> a bit out of the context, but it says, is there any potential that these volcanic rocks can be uh, a cap for an oil reservoir? Hmm. Uh, I don't think so. They're very permeable, so they're not an obvious cap rock uh, from my perspective. Of course, Glenny was mapping this area in the first place. Uh, looking for oil, perhaps underneath the ophiolite, it is a big anticline. And I suppose there's potential for source rocks underneath it. But none of the units of the ophiolite, certainly not the volcanic rocks, seem to be particularly good caps. Uh, you can see just in this uh, picture, right, that uh, they're almost like sponges, those pillar lavas arranged on top of each yeah. other. Um, so the other question is, beside copper, Anything else could be a useful um, resource from, from, for example, the basalts? Uh, in, the, in the VMS deposits themselves, uh, as I said, we have gold in some of them. I think it's, it's part of my, my current research to look whether some other overlooked metals could be enriched in those deposits. Uh, I won't say much more at that at this stage, but uh, I will just say that our demand for metal is evolving very rapidly at the moment. Uh, the technologies we're going to need metals for in the next 10 or 20 years are very different to the ones we have needed in the past 10 or 20 years. Uh, so that could evolve. In terms of the basalts, other, other, other metal resources, basalts themselves are a potential uh, carbon sequestration uh, material. Uh, there was a recent paper just out uh, in Nature talking about powdering basalts and spreading them out over yeah. fields. But I certainly w I wouldn't oh, recommend catch. that for, for the beautiful ophiolite basalts. <laughs> Better to leave <laughs> those. Uh, perhaps the peridotites are more, have more potential for that. But yeah, copper, I mean, copper and gold are, are great resources in, in themselves. Copper is going to increase in value. It's you, the amount of copper you need to put into an electric car or a wind turbine. Uh, just to electrify grids in general is incredible. A question from uh, Jamie Stewart. Uh, thank you for your talk. Any ideas of um, the age of the oceanic crust before subduction started? Um, it depends a bit how we interpret that, that map view. Uh, but in the Van Hinsbergen model, where we're situated within a sort of corner of the Arabian margin. There doesn't have to be much oceanic crust either side of the, of the proto-arc of, of the ophiolite as it forms. And in that case, that oceanic crust could simply be the uh, high B, or at least remnants of it, are, are the high B uh, volcanics which sit underneath the ophiolite. And they're Jurassic, Triassic, uh, they, they do go back quite a bit uh, older than, than the ophiolite itself. But I, I suppose we're still sitting in the Tethian uh, seaway there. So, so Tethian oceanic crust. Uh, but no, no, no evidence of older, in this case, older oceanic lithosphere, um, older than the 95 million years uh, of age. 
not within the ophiolite tectonic nap itself, but, but in the high B volcanics, in, in the in the tectonic naps which the ophiolite is piggybacked uh, on top of, there are Jurassic and Triassic volcanic rocks. Many of them have a, an alkaline signature. Uh, they look like they were relatively close to the continent near the margin, uh, but there's some more in there as well. And those could be basically the edges, uh, the old pre-existing edges either side of the of the Oman Ophiolite before it formed. But but yeah, I think looking around those edges and using that to test those uh, those map view models is a really promising line of research. The other question is from uh, Neil Fernandez. Uh, uh, Tom, any comments regarding the uh, relationship between one volume of bonanitic uh, magmatism and uh, copper uh, gold grades? Uh, one, this is the first question. The second question is the nature of the um, proto-subduction zone in terms of mantle, uh, mantle metal content. In, in terms of vo volume, it's, it's an interesting question. I can go back just one slide and look at this Rajmi area. So here we have a, a massive volume of, of bonanites, uh, but not necessarily uh, a lot of ore deposits. Whereas in the Raqqa area here, we have a tiny volume of bonanites and this, about the same size VMS deposit, even bigger, in fact. So the volume of, of, of bonanites may not be that important more the fact that uh, they tend to show up in these long-lived extensional structures which are favorable for VMS formation. Uh, in any case, if we look at both of these deposits, we can see that their foot walls do not consist of very much bonanite whatsoever. Uh, the, the fluids which produce both of those deposits circulated predominantly through uh, the underlying units, not through the, the thick ac accumulation of bonanites on top. Uh, I think perhaps that answered your question. Maybe, maybe volume is, is not too critical. There isn't much evidence you could be getting at that uh, for magmatic hydrothermal uh, additions, certainly not of copper. It seems like you can get plenty of copper just by leaching uh, sulfides in the rocks or leaching the rocks. And the second question on the pre-subduction metal content, it's very interesting and it's a good place to test it, right? Because we start with a a fairly pristine, we think, a depleted warm mantle, uh, so a morb-like mantle uh, composition, and then we progressively extract melts from it. And it doesn't. It doesn't uh, looking looking at the composition of, say, the geotimes lavas. It doesn't look like it was particularly copper-rich relative to a specific rise uh, mantle today. Uh, but how that mantle progresses through time in terms of its metal content is quite a complicated story. It depends on uh, stability of sulfides, uh, which in turn, uh, yeah, it's a complicated story, but it's one we're working on uh, at the moment, basically. So the other question is from, again, from Jamie Stewart. Um, any remains of this older crust um, ever found? Yeah, I, I think that potentially those those high B uh, volcanics beneath the ophiolite could be could be the closest thing we're going to find. It might it's 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 a fairly common case in most ophiolites that it's not very obvious where that crust either side of the newly formed ophiolite ended up. Yeah. Uh, probably because they're bounded by by big structures, and as they get abducted. The ophiolite just slides over them, but but those those high B volcanics sitting underneath the ophiolite fit in terms of geochemistry and timing as part of the older crust, and the rest the rest of the Tethys was uh, was probably subducted away to the north uh, after the subduction zone, which made uh, the ophiolite got clogged up. Um, Abdul Al Ghafri is, ask, is asking a question here. Any idea what is the reason behind the incomplete section of the autochthonous behind the ophiolites at Hawassina window? Any reasons behind the incomplete section of the autochthonous 
beneath the ophiolite at Hawassina window? Yeah, not particularly. I think there are much uh, more qualified people to, to answer that question, probably. Uh, yeah. At SQU and uh, maybe, also maybe Mike, he's uh, yeah, being a structured geologist a little bit. Perhaps there is a little bit of a, of a, a background there that you can. Yes, it's interesting that it's basically a, a different a different uh, structural setup. I'll continue. So basically, to make sure that we uh, try to cover most of the questions. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, let's uh, lots uh, to learn. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Neil Fernandez again. Um, I actually had a, a question from uh, from uh, my side. Have you guys attempted to try to uh, sort of uh, being a structured geologist yourself as well? Uh, attempted to try to backstrip uh, a section in this case from its current location and to try to backstrip it to its um, to its original location in the sea and see do we actually go for um, that 300 kilometer away distance from uh, the margin where we where it is in the current time. Normally, um, we never had somebody who uh, tackles basically the um, the uh, dynamics of the ophiolite emplacement. It's only the kinematics of it, and I would say very uh, humble <laughs> in terms of how the evolution of the of the ophiolite emplacement uh, to come to the Oman ophiolite. Yeah, personally, we haven't tackled that much. Once the Suhaila formation is separated, that's kind of the end of our our, our groups. Uh, interest in the topic, but it, it is important because that abduction story has to be consistent with the formation story, otherwise one of them is wrong. And from what I've read, the, the best explanation and discussion of this is in this uh, Mike Searle's 2007 paper, and there he shows uh, beautiful palinspastic uh, reconstructions of the ophiolite's position uh, the sedimentary volcanic units that are between the ophiolite and the Arabian margin and a structural explanation, uh, they end up down here, a structural explanation of how they come to be uh, piggybacked on top of one another and over the, <laughs> over the continent. So, so there's yeah. A, yeah, so, there's a bit of that. Uh, of course, of course. Um, I think we have a few questions coming up. Uh, Jamie Stewart again, what would be the age of the oceanic crust in the Gulf of Oman now, uh, same as uh, the Ophiolite or older? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, a paper very recently came out again from Mike Searle's group looking at the, the large scale structure of the Ophiolite in the UAE and their 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 cross section showed that the ophiolite doesn't root itself into the into the uh, oceanic crust here, uh, and that that oceanic crust is separate. And uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember uh, okay. when it was formed. It could be well, at least yeah. or uh, it's a little it's, bit actually. It's it's quite interesting. Yes, yes, yes. I, I saw I saw a little bit about the paper. There okay. are some other um, Ali et al. in uh, Nature Communications or, or one of those Nature journals. Ali et al. Twenty twenty. Uh, really good work done with uh, basically seismic. Uh, so check that okay. out. For, okay. Uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, Did you have a chance to compare uh, to Masiro Ophiolite? Um, is there any similarities? Or have you had a chance to, to compare? Personally, I haven't done that research, but uh, Hugh Rollinson published a paper four years ago or so in Frontiers, uh, Geoscience Frontiers, uh, making this direct comparison. And he uh, basically uh, concluded that the Masiro Ophiolite did form at a true mid-ocean ridge, uh, and that the Somalo ophiolite didn't. Uh, so I think there, there are some, there's some pretty fundamental differences between the two, and it's probably the, also the explanation of why there are no big VMS deposits on Mazira ophiolite. But the Mazira ophiolite, like the like the Somalo, uh, although it doesn't stick up above the ground as much, uh, it's an incredible geological feature, a unique geological feature. Uh, True mid ocean ridge ophiolites that are relatively intact are, are vanishingly rare. Uh, but you have one there with incredible outcrop as well. 
Okay. Um, is Oliven, this is uh, Harith, Oman, is Harith, I assume his name is, is Oliven Emerald existing, uh, does uh, Oliven Emerald exist in, uh, in Oman, Ophelite, uh, as an economically valuable um, mineral? It would be nice. Maybe it did in the, in the late Cretaceous, uh, olivine, big, beautiful olivines are called peridotes, they're, they're gems, gemstones. But in Oman, uh, there's been a little bit, at least a little bit of hydrothermal alteration, interaction with seawater uh, almost everywhere. And that's corroded away those, those olivines. Uh, so I've never seen one that looks particularly spectacular or valuable. Uh, every now and again, you can find uh, little millimeter one size ones like in those sands. Uh, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go and start a, a peridot. <laughs> company in Oman. Uh, I have a more of a, uh, a question uh, related in this case uh, through ge ge geophysical modeling, especially um, gravity modeling of um, this the, uh, the semial ophiolite or the ophiolite overall. You would see that the uh, surface exposure of, for example, um, the Rustak block, block um, is actually much larger towards the sea and the outcrop itself that we actually find at the surface is really small compared to what is uh, uh, hidden below. How, how, do you, how do you take that? Or how do you basically um, um, uh, take that from your perspective, in this case, as an ore geologist? Yeah, do you I mean, gra gravity is, is very helpful together with uh, magnetics. Gravity is going to show you a little bit deeper structures. And together with magnetics, it shows that uh, prospective ophiolite terrain extends right out underneath the Batana plane uh, here from the Rustak block and Highline block. Uh, there was no out. There's not. There's very little volcanic outcrop or no volcanic outcrop down there. So it's got to be explored for entirely geophysically. Uh, because of that, it was outside of the scope of, of this study. Uh, but exploration companies. There are there are exploration blocks all the way down there, and they're definitely perspective too. Uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, I was thinking actually of it from a more of an economical point of view. Uh, is there a point of actually trying to target those bodies of ophiolite, which are, uh, as I, as I said, geophysical data, uh, you know, tells you that they are, this much larger of the pie actually is is below there rather than what we see at the surface. So is there, um, in this case, um, a direction in terms of exploring for those compared, in this case, to just being focusing on the surface outcrops? Yes, definitely. Most, most of the uh, ore deposits that sit within a, a 100 meters or so of the surface in outcropping areas have already been found by uh, electromagnetic methods. Uh, and the next, all of the next discoveries pretty much will be made uh, out underneath the cover uh, by clever people uh, integrating geophysical methods like that. Uh, there are some complexities involved with uh, geophysical studies in Oman. There are some odd uh, conductive units that cover the top of the ophiolite. Uh, but what that basically means is that uh, there are probably going to be more deposits to be found. And uh, yeah, in, in areas where magnetics and gravity show that you have uh, ophiolite beneath you, lavas beneath you, that's a good place to look for deposits. Fantastic. Anna Hesos um, is asking, how, uh, how did you remove the secondary gold enrichment effect uh, in the average assay values, in the average of uh, assay values? Uh, we, <coughs> did, we didn't uh, try to remove any effect. Those, uh, that work by Sam Gilgan just took the company reported uh, average uh, resource resource gold uh, whether that's induced wh whether that comes from secondary gold enrichment uh, i've never seen any, any convincing argument for it but it's but it sounds like sounds like because it, like like it, like uh, it definitely happens in in cyprus uh, yeah sounds interesting okay the other question from um 
Lana Brett uh, saying uh, Safwa deposit seems to sit uh, in an undisturbed block between two large uh, extensional structures rather than a long strike. Um, are the dike swarms driving this hydrothermal circulations in the block between them? Yeah, it's a good question with that particular, I can go back to the, to the map. There. Uh, I suppose at the stage of uh, building the software deposit and the overlying and, and all the bononitic uh, lavas around it, uh, we've generally, we're gonna be having uh, intrusions uh, below dike swarms around. There's just a decent amount of, of general heat flow uh, in the area. The reason it's positioned there, uh, it's probably a structural uh, explanation. For some reason, uh, lots of de deposit types actually, not just VMS, like to situate themselves off of the, the biggest structures and on these sort of secondary structures. And we didn't map anything in there, uh, but in the pit there is a there is a small normal fault uh, at the back, so it's related to a structure. Uh, I would guess that it's uh, also related to these these larger scale structures, but something a bit smaller. In terms of heat source, tr tricky. There are these there are these big uh, dolerite uh, intrusions around. Uh, we could only sort of map them where they outcropped. One of them does show up in the pit. But uh, it looked like it cross-cut the the ore mineralization to me. Uh, but there could be could be other intrusive bodies around that we didn't map or notice. Fantastic! Very interesting um, conclusion there that you have is more of um, shear zones basically rather than um, um, simple mantle convection uh, or mantle. Uh, basically, uh, uh, how should I say, cell movement or convection, internal convection uh, movement. Yeah. It's a shear zone. Would, would you be able to sort of um, get any other evidence in, in the form of, let's say, um, uh, myelinitic, myelinitic structures um, that sort of some, sort of, some sort of myelinitic structures associated to it? Uh, is there any any strong evidence uh, other than uh, than in this case um, than in this case pod? so you, you you talked about the chromite uh, uh, pods which are associated to these uh, shear zones uh, in the Wadi Rajmi example I'm trying actually to, to focus on yeah. and uh, you said that this, these uh, chromite pods are are associated to these shear zones so it's more of a structural rather than um, a flow associated or 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 am I uh, mixing apples in this case and, and oranges. No, no, this, these apples and oranges come together. Uh, so these, these shear zones, they are, they are myelinitic. Uh, they're well described uh, by several papers, uh, but they're also dunitic. So they're, they're not just grain size reduced, but they also have a different mineralogy to the surrounding rocks. Uh, and these, these, this dunite uh, rock, olivine dominated rock, uh, suggests that uh, melt has traveled, migrated through them. Uh, that they've firstly been melted out, uh, all of the clinoproxene and orthoproxene, uh, and then that melts have migrated along them. So they're, in the mantle at least, they're both shear zones, uh, so high temperature ductal shear zones and melt migration paths. And then as we move further up the crust into the brittle regime, uh, they become faults, uh, uh, definitely gets, gets complicated, uh, but they seem to become more brittle and those uh, dikes show up, which uh, dikes are also brittle features. So it seems to fit would pretty be, well. Mm, would but you be well, able to determine uh, to determine a direction of, uh, in this case, of a, of, a, of a slip from, from these, as be, because of your your um, your uh, basically of uh, inclination towards more of a, um, a supra subduction uh, rather than a, a more associated, uh, in this case. Um, uh, uh, Ophiolites, so maybe this can can lead some can give some information of how in this case what's the direction of of uh, of, of push uh, towards between the two the two sides of of uh, of the continent. Is there any kind of evidence from it? Uh, yeah. So 
I mean, I guess the important thing to keep in mind is that these we think all these these shear zones and these features develop during the post magmatic post axial uh, phase. Uh, so not necessarily during that that first axial phase because they they seem to offset the axial crust. Uh, but there was a recent paper by uh, Japanese colleagues uh, Umino San uh, and co-authors, and they looked at the structural implications of these dike swarms and deduced uh, because the dike swarms seem to cut orthogonally to the uh, the axial sheeted dike swarms that they record a, a rotation in the stress field. Uh, so that perhaps would fit with the rotation model or some kind of tectonic uh, change in general. In terms of just the simple slip of these, these structures, you can deduce it pretty well from the map. Uh, I guess the only the only point to make is that many of these, especially the brittle structures in the upper crust, were reactivated to some extent during the abduction of the ophiolite. Uh, that is so, that is possible. so, uh, so what you see is an integration, the cumulative offset through all of those different slip phases, including the seafloor unrelated uh, abduction phase. So really figuring out what was the seafloor kinematics of those faults uh, would be a project unto itself. Uh, and people will have to go there and look for mineral defined uh, kinematic indicators. Yeah. Fantastic. But we have a lot Fantastic. of dikes. There's a lot of space made, that's for sure. So I think, uh, broadly speaking, extension uh, up down the page, uh, which is roughly, I think, what uh, Umino and co has worked out it seems to make sense here. Good, good, good. Pity is that we cannot actually go for a field trip, uh, uh, <laughs> for leading you leading a field trip uh, with, with our colleagues uh, who are actually uh, virtually you, uh, meeting us and attending this uh, very interesting talk. Um, well, as the time in this case has uh, basically uh, whizzed through our talk and uh, we thank you uh, for uh, a very nice and informative and up-to-date uh, talk that basically gives us gave us uh, another update about uh, the Oman Ophiolite and uh, in this case the VMS uh, exploration in Oman. It's alive and we would like actually to keep that alive and thanks to you and thanks to other researchers who are actually working in this area to promote more and uh, more work and more discovery inshallah for the future of Oman and future of uh, of, of uh, the knowledge as well that we earn and gain as we go through this uh, sift through this, uh, this the work that we had so far. Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for a very nice talk, and thank you, our um, uh, in this case listeners, uh, for a very nice uh, for a very uh, 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 nice set of questions. And uh, I'm sure if you had further questions, you can actually approach. Um, Thomas uh, through his his uh, his email. Uh, should you have any other questions, you can also um, uh, communicate with us, and we will try to link you with uh, with Thomas uh, in the future. I think with that we conclude our talk by the Geological Society as part of our summer um, talks. In this case, summer virtual talks. Thank you very much, and have a good day, um, all of you, wherever you are. Thanks so much, Dr. Ali, and thanks everyone for, yeah. for coming. Sure.